Well, good morning. My name is Shane Newsom. For those of you who don't know, uh, I attend here. Uh, we moved back to Dallas or moved to Dallas about two years ago now. Uh, from I was a pastor of a church out there, and it's my privilege today to uh, launch us into a series on the seven deadly sins. Uh, um, I say it's my privilege. <laughs> I was thinking about as I was watching this video, like I'm going to get up there now and talk about the seven deadly sins, <laughs> the juxtaposition. Maybe it's completely biblical to step into such juxtapositions, right? Um, so the task before me today is to, uh, to introduce us to the series, to kind of set the stage for us, but also to look at the first in our series on the seven deadly sins, which is envy. I imagine uh, as I think about this, a few potential uh, initial responses to this series and to the idea of this series. Perhaps you're here and you hear a preacher standing on a stage talking about sin and you think, well, here we go. Another Christian preacher trying to make me feel bad about myself. Trying to motivate me through guilt, fear, and shame. How cliche. Some of us here maybe hear that um, and we are pulled back uh, we're reminded of real harm and abuse at the hand of church leaders or other Christians or parents all couched in the language of sin. Others of you in here, I suspect, maybe hear the pastor talk about sin and your chest swells a little. Uh, you might say a little pridefully that you're in a church and you're glad you're in a church that takes sin seriously, unlike those others, whoever they are. Perhaps you hear seven deadly sins and begin to think of all those folks out there that really need to hear this, as if what makes them deadly is our propensity and ability to weaponize them against other people. Some of us may simply see the language of sin as passe, an outmoded religious artifact that gets in the way of true human flourishing and that in fact is antithetical to the love of Jesus. And I suspect we all land somewhere among these possibilities. Maybe there's others I didn't think of, but I feel like that's us somewhere in there and maybe multiple places in there. And so I guess what I'll ask of you in this moment is first to notice what is your gut reaction to a seven-week series on seven deadly sins? Pay attention to where you feel it. What thoughts arise in you? And then as you notice those things, allow this sermon, this series to act as a sort of dialogue with those thoughts, with those feelings. And then finally, I'll ask you to hold out the possibility that a series on the seven deadly sins is only rightly offered as an opportunity for your healing. That puts the burden on me in some sense and others who will get up here and speak to them. How is our healing found here? I think we can say that the series succeeds or fail, fails on its invitation to life. So how shall we begin our journey down this path? One that feels to me a bit perilous. First, I think we should orient ourselves to the series and then we'll take some time to look at the first deadly sin, envy, as I've already said. Why seven deadly sins? Where did this notion come from? The ancient King Solomon in Proverbs writes this, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. 
over time, this particular list uh, became the basis for the seven deadly sins. Envy, pride, greed, gluttony, lust, anger or wrath, and sloth. We can find the early church fathers in the 200s formulating this list, desert fathers, monks who went out into the desert to escape sin, and what they found themselves doing is contemplating its deadliness. And so by the two and three hundreds, this list has come into existence in the life of the church, and it crops up throughout the history of the church and really even in pop culture. So the seven deadly sins have a long storied history in the life of the church, which I think makes them at least um, worth consideration, our consideration. When we think about the seven deadly sins, we're not necessarily offering them as the vilest possible sins we can think of. I think more than that, we're um, offering, they're offered as, as a way of looking at this, uh, our sins that are most common to us. They're the ditches we most often fall into. Or we could say that these sins are the roots that all our particular misdeeds grow from. So that's a brief introduction to the seven deadly sins. And I want us to then ask ourselves the question, what makes them deadly? Because I think this goes to the very heart of God's story of love and healing for the world. It, it, we must actually ask ourselves uh, why we would uh, talk about sin this way. And why is it important to see that death is their destination? So what is sin according to the story of God? If we're gonna talk about sin according to that story, then we have to begin where the story begins. And I think this is essential, absolutely essential. If we're gonna talk about sin, my particular sins or our corporate sins, we have to begin where the story of God begins. And that story begins always, always, always in goodness. It begins in the goodness of all creation. Sin is not a flaw of material things. Sin is not a flaw of this world. Sin is not a flaw of your body or my body. All of those things God created and from the very beginning, time and time and time again said, this is good. You are good. We are good. And so if we're going to understand uh, the, good, the, the deadliness of sin, we must start where the story starts, which is in a world created in wholeness and flourishing. There is no dislocation between humans and God, humans and one another. There was no interior dislocation, spiritual, mental, emotional, or psychological nor was there any bodily dislocations. We were created whole and good and without shame, without sin. And finally, there was only wholeness in humanity's relationship with the created world, your vocation, the things that you put your hands to, to build and create and make. So, we can say and we need to remember that the story of sin actually starts in a story of what the Bible, the word the Bible uses is shalom, wholeness. And so when we think about sin, we can think about sin as anything that moves against or perverts that original goodness. And that's why we talk about it as deadly. It's not to shame and guilt and fear you into behaving a particular way. It's to invite you into a story where shalom is not only the beginning, but it's the goal, it's the destination, it's our hope. So as we burrow in a little bit further, when we think about sin, um, I just... <laughs> 
have a list here. I thought it was interesting just to pull out all the various ways scriptures, uh, the scriptures talk about and picture the story uh, uh, invites us into understanding uh, the breaking of that original goodness. The scriptures talk about sin as a, a kind of falling short of the goal, the good, what we were intended and made for. It talks about it as a transgression of boundaries, a, a kind of crime, a violation of law. It talks about it as slavery and insanity. It talks about it as enmity, enmity with God and enmity with, the, with uh, each other. It talks about it as debt and denial and idolatry. It uses the language of twistedness and estrangement and sickness brokenness. Dorothy Sayers says it this way. She says, sin is a deep interior dislocation of the soul. Cornelius Planiga, who writes a, a book on sin, the Breviary of sin or on sin, says this, sin is the missing of a target a wandering from the path, a straying from the fold. Sin is a hard heart and a stiff neck. Sin is blindness and deafness. It is both the overstepping of a line and a failure to reach it. Both transgression and shortcoming, sin is a beast crouching at the door. In sin, people attack or evade or neglect the, their divine calling. These and other images suggest deviance. Even when it is familiar, sin is never normal. Above all, sin disrupts and resists the vital human relation to God. Or as a friend of mine says, he says that sin is essentially a false way of being human. A false way of living with God, other people, and with the world. It is an undoing of the goodness of creation. And I love this. In this sense, sin is the ultimate virtual reality. And it's the deep impulse of the fallen heart to set up camp in that parody. Given not only the complexities of the heart, but also the complexity of the culture which fills in the blank slate of the heart's desire, this parody can take potentially an infinite number of manifestations. We can embrace fantasy about our bodies, our money, our sexuality, our vocations, our relationships, and on and on. And the temptation to construe reality along the contours of our desire to literally build a false creation is everywhere. And then he says this, and never more so than, than now. I don't know about that, but certainly at least as much so as ever now. In fact, I continue to be basically persuaded that the chief destructive force of contemporary Western culture is the unparalleled power and fertility of its lies. So, when we think of the parody of the good and the fertility of the, the lies of our Western culture, where does envy fall? As we read in Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. When we think about envy, we tend to see envy and, and use it synonymously with jealousy. And that's not necessarily bad. It's not, it's not sufficient, I would say. Jealousy is actually a word used of God for his people. Right? So jealousy and envy, envy's never good. Homer Simpson is being scolded at one point by uh, Lisa for being jealous of his neighbor. And Homer says, I'm not jealous, I'm envious. Jealousy is when you worry someone will take what you have. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Envy is wanting someone else's life. You see uh, something about their life and you think that they have it better than you do. 
And it be, that thought and that idea begins to uh, corrupt and twist your soul until your only thought of happiness or your, the, the way you think about happiness is through gaining what they have and ultimately them losing what they have. Frederick Buechner, one of my heroes, says the way other people's luck, envy is the way other people's luck can sting like wasps. Have you ever felt that? John Gilgood, I don't know if that's how you say his name, um, is, uh, according to some, a great British actor. I don't know. But in his biography, um, here, here's what he says. It says, when Sir Lawrence Olivier played Hamlet in 1948 and the critics, the critics raved, I wept. That's in me. Envy operates out of a, a scarcity mindset. It views someone else's gain as personal loss. Kendrick Lamar, in one of his bonus tracks called Black Boy Fly, Talks about, he says, I used to be jealous of Aaron Aflalo, which is an NBA player. And he goes on to say, I used to be jealous of Jason. Then he ends this, this song by saying, I wasn't jealous because of the talents they got. I was terrified they'd be the last black boys to fly out of Compton. I think Kendrick's talking about envy. He thinks that his good is somehow diminished as people get out and make it. And as he looked on as a boy growing up in Compton, he was scared that them gaining was his loss. That's envy. Envy is the green-eyed monster, and as I said before, it incubates in scarcity's fear that whatever somebody else has means I've lost something. K.J. Ramsey in her book called uh, The Lord is My Courage, she writes about her journey uh, through uh, trauma and healing, uh, particularly from church trauma, but also family trauma, talks about this scarcity mindset in our culture. Here's what she says. Most of us struggle to rise into our lives with courage and hear that we are beloved. Hear that. Because, hear that we're beloved because we've all been baptized in different water, the stream of scarcity. Most of us learn early in life to stay by scarcity stream of striving and strength, power. Where the only way we are given a name beloved is if we earn every single day. That's the seeds of envy, that kind of mentality that we live our lives to keep proving our worth, striving, she says, to rid ourselves of a constant sense of shame, never quite feeling like we belong. So when and why is it deadly? It is here that it, we see envy's deadliness. It is the grind to always attain and prove under the Damocles sword that we're never enough and will never fully belong. And all we can do is continue to strive day after day to gain something and always gain something at somebody else's loss because there's limited resources. And if you have, then I can't have it. Therefore, it shows up in both our inability to rejoice in someone else's good, but also that inverse delight in their downfall. So I'll give you some examples. For me, it shows up, uh, you know, we get the bag from Chick-fil-A, and I, it is, this is so instinctive and maybe a little bit silly, but it's true. I immediately scan the bag for the fries, because I got to make sure that I at least don't get the smallest thing of fries. 
And if, like, if, if somebody else brings the bag home, I look for the fries and I'm immediately suspicious that you ate some of these fries on the way home, didn't you? <laughs> okay, it's silly, but it's real. And it actually creates conflict. Like my daughter knows that I refuse to share my fries. I mean, how pathetic is that, dad, on Father's Day? It's that sense that, uh, that somebody else's gain is my loss. Maybe this isn't as subtle, but it's still maybe not as serious. It, it, it shows up in how delicious it, I find it in my own life when one of my sports enemy, f- enemies fails spectacularly. Right, we see this. Maybe it's minor. I mean, I want to believe that there's a a kind of carve out for sports hate and sports envy. (laughs) And then I find myself going, why do I care so much that they lose? And it feels kind of gross. And there's no true joy in it. It's not real joy. It's not like the joy for those of you who who went along for the ride to watch the Rangers finally win a World Series. Right? That's joy. All the years I spent just hoping the St. Louis Cardinals would lose uh, year after year, that wasn't real joy. Sorry, Zach. (laughs) Y'all got us. This is the kind of mindset that creeps in and it it creeps into our lives and it's not just sports and it's not just fries. It's the way we maybe inhabit our lives in social media and we eye other people's lives through that lens and it, it turns and churns something in us and we start to feel like, I wish that was my life. What's wrong with me? Why can't I have that? And so another uh, subtle consequence of this mindset is not only does it twist us into seeing uh, some some sort of uh, sick pleasure out of other people's failure, but it also twists us so that we cannot um, sufficiently or healthily self-reflect and self-critique because for me to lose is to really, really lose. And so if I have to begin to name my envy, or my pride, then that's death. If we see our lives through this uh, this lens, then we cannot uh, begin to see ourselves honestly and grow and heal from our own deadly sins. To admit failure or wrongdoing in a scarcity mindset is to shift gain to someone else's ledger, it's to lose. That's why it's called the green-eyed monster because it's gangrenous to the soul and it's delicious. Some people have said that, that envy is the only sin of the seven deadly sins that's not any fun. I think that's true. Envy has a rich heritage in biblical stories. Cain envied Abel, so he ended up murdering him. Jacob envied Esau, and they fought all their days. Leah envied Rachel, and how Jacob loved her more. Joseph's brothers envied how his father favored him, so he threw him into slavery. And in our passage we read today, Saul envied David and the accolades he received for saving his life. I mean, the story is that for 40 days, 40 nights, the Israelites lined up for battle and they all chickened out when, they, when Goliath just talked trash. And Saul's shame was on, on display for everybody to see and David rescued him from it. And yet we hear the story of David coming out of that battle and people singing his praises and says, Saul is struck down as thousands and David's is ten thousands. And we're told that this displeased Saul. He envied David. 
so much so that he tried to kill him at least six times. Envy can become murderous, truly deadly. The text says that Saul eyed David from that time on. And that's how envy works. It grows silently within us like a cancer. That's one of the reasons it's associated again with the color green. It's like something growing in you, wrapping itself around your heart and choking out the life. So how do you know it's growing in you? Can you rejoice in the good of others? Like for some of us, there's, this is kind of a default setting where we can't really find ourselves rejoicing for the good of, other, of anyone. Maybe. Maybe it's just certain people. Maybe it's just certain kinds of people. Not only does envy make it impossible for you to rejoice with others because of the comparison, it makes it impossible to enjoy what you have because of resentment. So our last question for the day is what is its cure? What shall we do? How do we um, disentangle ourselves? How do we sort of uh, lance the infection that envy is? I think our text points us down a really, really important uh, avenue, and that is uh, we uh, begin to push back on the twisting effects of en envy as we shift our gaze from ourselves. See, Saul uh, hears the songs of David's praise, and he begins to turn inward, and he begins to become twisted and angry and murderous. And Jonathan, who was also on the battle lines, also refused to go fight Goliath, and he was a warrior in his own right also carried the shame of that when he sees David come back with the victory over Goliath. Jonathan, we're told, his heart is knit to David. Jonathan moves out of himself and he begins to see something of himself in another. He sees that his life and his goodness, his hope is in uh, the life and the hope of, uh, of, of David. So if we're going to shift our, um, our self, um, our lives and our, our, our attention onto another, we must see who this other is. And Jonathan understood because in this moment, what he does is he starts stripping off all the markings of the, of the reality that he is actually in line for the king. And he says, no, David, you're king. And in David's victory, Jonathan sees his victory and he begins to see his identity in the, the, the king provided by God. If we're going to battle envy, we must see that our lives and our goodness are ultimately and, and totally found in the provision of God's king. See, the scarcity mindset will twist you into thinking uh, that um, God fixes you in order that he can love you. Rather than the truth of the story is that he loves you and therefore he will move heaven and earth to heal you and forgive you. And Jonathan sees it in David, God's anointed. He sees David not as a rival in whose gain is his loss, but as a savior in whose gain is everything that Jonathan longs to have. And I hope you know by now that David in this moment is pointing to his great, 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 great son.
that the way we move our eyes off of self and out of envy is to cast our eyes on the love of God that's for us in Jesus and that our gain is always in the life and the death and the resurrection of another. Lastly, I just want to invite you to maybe a practice. If you find envy is a particularly invasive sin in your life, we'd like to invite you to a practice of cultivating joy. Ross Gay, in his book, uh, uh, he set out to write, uh, on his 42nd birthday, he decided for every day for a year, he would write an essay a day where he named something that he delighted in. Something in that day that brought him delight. And here's what he says about that. A month or two into this project's delights were calling to me, write about me. Write about me because it's rude not to acknowledge your delights. I'd tell them that though they might not become essayettes is what he calls them, they were still important and I was grateful for them. Which is to say, I felt my life to be more full of delight. Not without sorrow or fear or pain or loss, but more full of delight. I also learned this year that my, that my now listen to this, I also learned this year that my delight grows much like love and joy when I share it. You see how that moves? That's a, that's a move away from, from the invitation to envy. would like to invite us all to consider what it looks like to behold our Savior and move into a, 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 a cultivating of joy and delight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace, your mercy, your kindness to us. God, may you bless us first with the, the, the eyes to see that our good is found in our hero king and his salvation. And then I pray that you would teach us how to delight, to cultivate it, even in the midst of our sorrows, our pain, our confusion. And Lord, may we be what the people of God, of God have always been and what you've called us to be, which is a people who share our joy with each other. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.